Hello, I'm David Grease, Professor Emeritus of Computer Science here at Cornell, although I'm still teaching because our courses are so huge. I'm here to interview my friend and colleague of almost 50 years, John Hopcroft, who received the Turing Award in 1986. So we have been colleagues for almost 50 years. We share something else. We were both born in 1939. I'm four and a half months older than he is. John, as you'll see, is one of the most eminent computer scientists ever. He's excelled in and made significant contributions to all three aspects of computer science. That's research, that's teaching, and there's service to the community. His work and service have placed him in the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Science, as a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Science, and he has the CRA Distinguished Service Award, five honorary degrees, nine to ten honorary professorships, the list goes on and on. John was a co-winner of the ACM Turing Award in 1986, as I said earlier. Here's the citation, I'll read it. With Robert E. Tarjan, for fundamental achievements in the design and analysis of algorithms and data structures. John and Bob developed a linear algorithm for testing whether a graph was planar, a remarkable achievement. This was back in the early 70s, and they both contributed greatly to the fields of algorithms and data structures for the next, well, he still is doing it. So let's begin, John. Uh, you grew up in Seattle. What was it like then? Well, th this, of course, was a long time ago, and Seattle was a small city. <laughs> I think the population was only about a half a million. Uh, and the other side of Lake Washington, where Microsoft and many of the companies are today, simply was, was woods. And, and it was a city that you could walk and explore, and mm -hmm. that's what I enjoyed doing as, as a child. What about, the, what did you do for fun as a kid? Well, uh, I, I liked, I, I searched a lot for other kids to play with, to explore. But, but didn't find too many. But if there was just a path in the woods, I wanted to see where the path went. Hmm. And I wanted to see where various streets went. And I now think, you know, I, I was just kind of curious and was exploring. You've done that all your life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about your dad, tell me about your dad. Well, my, my dad was a actually an, an illegal uh, citizen. He had walked across the border from Canada into the mm. U.S. And I, I didn't realize it, but he worked for half of minimum wage. And we were uh, probably a very poor family, but uh, my parents were quite frugal, and I didn't know that we were poor. Mm. Uh, and one of the advantages, I think, that I had that many people don't uh, is my parents loved one another. And I never heard my father or my mother say anything negative about the other. Uh, and the other, the other thing is that neither of them had graduated from high school. Uh, and maybe that wasn't that uncommon in those days. Uh, but they wanted me to have a better life than they did. And that, I think, was almost their goal in life. And um, so they wanted to make sure that I had a university education. And they spent their time uh, teaching me to swim, teaching me to do things uh, in a way which I think a lot of other children didn't mm -hmm. get th this kind of advantage. And I now know that I'm, I'm actually reading literature on early childhood development. Because many researchers say the first two years of a child's life are critical in how they're going to succeed. And having a stable environment has a big impact on how the brain develops. And I think my parents gave me that. And I think that my, my success, a lot of it goes back to that early childhood. And I guess I would like to see everybody today have a level playing field. So that in our inner city where maybe life is rather chaotic, uh, it would be great if, if we put in place high quality mm -hmm. child care. So maybe, maybe near the end, since that is one of the things you're thinking about, 
right. we can talk about that later. That, 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 that would be great. Early childhood is not something that computer scientists think about too much. No. And but maybe they should. They should. Yeah. So what were your best and worst subjects? Well, I, I liked math, and that, mm -hmm. that, was, that was my best. And I liked the science that, that we got, but, but in elementary school, this, the science there wasn't that much mm -hmm. taught. Uh, probably where I was not so good was history. Uh, what I didn't like about history at that time, it was just a list of who the generals were and who, mm -hmm. what the battles were and the dates. There was very little explanation as to why the world evolved the way it did and so on. So basically all through your life it's been explanations you're looking for and not just facts. Right, Yeah. right. Um, in high school, what did you want to do? Uh, high school, um, I, uh, once again, what, what I was good at was, was, mm -hmm. was math. Um, I, I, I wanted to meet other kids and go out and explore. And I found a few more there that wanted to explore, that wanted to do things like uh, go skiing or something like that. Uh, but uh, high, high school, I was pretty much focused on, you know, getting an education. And, and one of the things in those days, we did have more time, more free time. Uh, school would get out a little after three, and then we could pretty much do what we want in the afternoon and, mm -hmm. and evenings. That's not the case not today. Not the case <laughs> today, and I think we should go back to that. Um, because, you know, part of your education uh, is uh, learning how to interact with other kids and, mm -hmm. and other things, and I, I think we may have lost some of that. I think our use of these cell phones is contributing to that loss <laughs> tremendously. Uh, was there a particular teacher who inspired you? Yeah, uh, I was fortunate to have really good teachers. Uh, the one that most was John Goodwin, who taught uh, high school algebra. But he was also the football coach. And y you may wonder, how could a football coach be a superb algebra <laughs> teacher? But I think what it was is something that which made him good at both was he had a way of conveying to you that he really cared about your success and you didn't want to disappoint him. And, and that's why he was good, I mm -hmm. think, in both roles. What, you went to an elementary school? Yeah, I went to an elementary school, uh, a Catholic school that was run by nuns. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that the nuns actually did not have college education. Uh, when they graduated from high school, they went into a religious order because they wanted to help other kids. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most important things in a teacher being good is that they care about the success of their students. And that was your football coach also. You the football tell. coach cared about um, the success of students. And was this a Jesuit college that yeah, you go it, to? It then? was a Jesuit high school. High school. And I also went to a Jesuit college, yeah. uh, Seattle University. Mm -hmm. So why did you go to Stanford? How was that? And well, what? that came about by accident because um, I, when I lived in Seattle, I just assumed I would go to the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. But when I went over to talk to them, uh, one of the faculty members said that they couldn't admit me to the graduate program because I went to an unaccredited university. Mm -hmm. Now, I sort of didn't really believe that he wouldn't, that I wouldn't be admitted, but I went back and talked to my department chair and the department chair said, why aren't you applying to Stanford? Hmm. So I applied to Stanford and they were happy to take me even though mm -hmm. I was from an unaccredited institution. You, you got your, your degree fairly early, didn't you? How old were you when you got your? Uh, I, was, I was 24. 24. In, in those yeah. days, you could get a degree much sooner than now. You just had to spend three years. Yeah. That's it, that, and yeah. if you did the work. Now the average is more like five or six. Right. I, I would like to see that change. Oh, I, I would like to see it go back, <laughs> but uh, I don't think it's going to. No. What did your parents want you to do when you grew up? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, my father uh, worked, uh, once he became a citizen, uh, got a job at a, a power and light company, and he was a janitor. 
But he saw draftsmen sitting at tables uh, in white shirts and drinking coffee and, and doing what he thought was very little work. And they were paid a lot more than he was. And he thought they were electrical engineers. Hmm. And so he said, you ought to be an electrical engineer. And it didn't put any pressure on me, but um, I, I liked science and math, so engineering seemed reasonable. And I, when I, I started in electrical engineering, I enjoyed it, and it was a good choice. So there weren't any computers at that time. What did you do in electrical engineering? Uh, well, we studied uh, linear circuits, uh, and so I learned how to solve linear equations. Mm. And uh, Well, we, we also learned a lot of things that uh, aren't necessarily useful today, like about rotating machinery, uh, power lines, mm -hmm. Uh, vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes, yeah, because just about the time I understood vacuum tubes, transistors came along. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, where, where, what was your first exposure to computers? Well, uh, one of the faculty members in physics uh, at Seattle U uh, had a, a computer program that wasn't working, and so he hired me to debug it. And this, this was before Fortran. This was written in uh, assembly language. And the computer in that day, I think it was um, 650, 650, IBM 650. Yeah. And it had a rotating drum. And so if you fetched two numbers and added them, and you were going to store it, you had to know about how far this drum had rotated if mm -hmm. you wanted your program to run fast. And so they had applied a program to this program to, uh, to determine where things were stored. So it was kind of hard to debug, mm -hmm. but that was my first exposure to computing. So who taught you the assembly language? Uh, assembly language then was, was pretty Machine simple. language. It was. Uh, so they just said, here's the manual, go do oh, this. No, they, I didn't even have a manual. You didn't have anything. Uh, you just knew that. A stood it for the code for add, and hmm. uh, I mean it was there were only maybe ten symbols. Ten and symbols. So, so you never really had instruction in. That's in right. Code. Did you ever take a programming course? No, no. never, never. <laughs> I've had. I took one. It was on a fake machine in a, for a fake assembly language, because we didn't have any computers. So we uh -huh. would write subroutines to solve sine and cosine. We had no way of knowing whether they were the right. The teacher didn't either. The basic idea was try to make it take fewer instructions than the person sitting next to you. Right. That, that, that was back in 1969. OK. Uh, 59, 59. Yeah, well, see, I started in 63. But there was a computer. The uh, University of Washington had one, and we could go over mm -hmm. and use it for 15 ah, minutes. Okay. So. What did you study? I think we covered this partially. What did you study in electrical engineering? What did you think of the labs you had to do? Well, uh, electrical engineering, a lot of it was having to do with physical devices and things of that type. And initially, I was going to go into lasers. <laughs> and, but when I took a laboratory course, I realized I was not good at laboratory work and physical devices. <laughs> and that I really enjoyed the mathematics more. So I, I switched uh, from that to uh, more, more systems, theoretical more stuff. theoretical stuff. Information theory? Information theory. Who was the person there, Norm Abramson? Nor Norm Abramson yeah. was there, and he yeah. was a world-class teacher. Mm -hmm. I just ran into many people who, mm -hmm. were, who were good like that. Uh, and uh, so whenever I saw that Norm Abramson was teaching a course, I signed up for it. Because <laughs> I, I just would learn a lot more in a course from him than many of the other faculty. Who were the most important influences, influencers in your life at college? Well, um, it, in, uh, in Seattle University, there was the chair of the department, uh, was a priest, uh, Father Wood. Uh, he had a big impact on me. Mm -hmm. And also, there was another faculty member, Byron Gage, uh, who had just gotten his PhD at University of Washington. So he wasn't that much older mm -hmm. than, than I was. And, uh, and we did things together. He, he had a, a, a motorboat and went water skiing, and he took me mm -hmm. water skiing and things like that, that that were fun. 
So you graduated from Stanford ECE. Where was your first job? How did you get it? Well, this was kind of a stroke of luck uh, because I was originally planning on going back to Seattle University and getting a faculty position. Uh, but when I talked, I was walking past Bernie Woodrow's office and his door was open. He was talking on the phone and he motioned. He said, John, come on in. And at the time, he was talking to Ed McCluskey at Princeton, who wanted to know if there were any uh, PhD students graduating who would make good faculty. And Bernie handed me the phone and said, talk to Ed McCluskey. And I talked to him a little, and McCluskey invited me back to Princeton for an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had never thought of, you know, uh, going, going back. But I thought, it, uh, you know, I ought to at least go for the interview. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went for the interview, and uh, when they offered me a job, uh, I thought it would be good to see what an Ivy League institution is like mm -hmm. and go there for three years. But even then, I still thought maybe of going back to Seattle <laughs> University. Uh, it, I didn't realize, you know, that uh, to get tenure, you had to publish papers. Yeah, I, that I, idea wasn't there yet. That <laughs> idea wasn't there yet. It, it's interesting, most people nowadays don't know how the field was at that time. Yeah. I got my PhD in the Munich Institute of Technology in Germany, and I got a job at Stanford without an interview. Uh -huh. My thesis advisor wrote to George Forsyth, the chair, said, take him, and they took me. This was right. a time when all of the new departments, uh, departments was first right. was in 1964, Purdue, and then Stanford, Cornell, and others, 65, 66, and so on. They're all looking for faculty members. They right. couldn't find them. Right. So it, it totally different ball game than today. Right, but there was also, there wasn't the same emphasis on publications, because I had zero publications <laughs> when yes. Princeton hired me. I, yeah. I had, I don't know if I had actually submitted my thesis yet, or whether I was still writing <laughs> my first publication. Yeah, yes. Uh, today, you wouldn't get into a PhD program, <laughs> probably. You almost have to have an undergraduate research right. paper. Right. Yeah, so what a change. Um, did you continue your PhD work when you went to Princeton? No, no. Um, I, I decided I was looking around for something else to do. and. Um, at that time, one other thing that has changed, uh, at that time, they wanted someone with a PhD and someone who would do research because they thought that that would keep them up to date with the field their entire career. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't that they were hiring somebody because they wanted to increase the research reputation mm -hmm. of the institution. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the focus was much more on educating the next generation yeah. of talent than mm -hmm. it is today. So you were at Princeton. You left Princeton for Cornell after two and a half, three years. Right. How did that happen? Well, it <coughs> happened for two reasons. Um, one, one of them, there's, there was a lot of politics going on in the department. Uh, there was a more established area of electrical engineering where they, whenever there was a faculty slot, they could bring in 10 highly qualified people. Mm -hmm. And when McCluskey would try to bring in someone in computer science, there basically wasn't <laughs> anybody. He could bring in somebody, but the person maybe wasn't as good mm -hmm. as these 10 people in this other field. And it was hard to make the argument that computer science was growing and they better make an investment in it. Yeah. They hadn't started a, a department Oh, yet. there was, was no, it wasn't easy. a department. It was simply that McCluskey understood that computer science, mm -hmm. that, well, that computing, I shouldn't computing. use the word computer science because that didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, that computing was going to be important, and he was trying to hire people uh, in that area. Mm -hmm. But there weren't programs in the area, and so it was it was hard. But he had a vision. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, the other thing is, I ran the seminar series, uh, and the budget was only big enough to invite in two external people mm -hmm. in the semester. And so I invited uh, Uris Hartmanis from Cornell and Fred Henney from MIT. These were two of the leading scientists, I, th I thought. And, uh, and I talked to McCluskey, or uh, excuse me, when I talked to uh, Hartmanis afterwards, uh, he was telling me how they were trying to hire at Cornell. 
and I happened to ask what they paid, mm -hmm. and they were paying an assistant professor 50% more than I was earning. And so I asked him, I said, you know, uh, what would you pay me? And uh, he made me an offer that, and I thought then, you know, maybe it would be much better to be in a department uh, where they really understood what I was doing and mm -hmm. then in a department that I was going to have to fight for yes, recognition. Yes. Uh, and so th that's why I went to Cornell. So for those of you who don't know, Uris Hart Manis was the founding chair of computer science here uh, at Cornell in 1965 when the department was formed. He was a mathematician physicist, uh, but he was doing groundbreaking work on, on complexity. Uh, he's thought of as the father of computational complexity. I tell people my field is computational simplicity. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you came here. Uh, what, what were you doing at, at Princeton? I know that you had an early significant contribution, a book with Jeff Ullman, Formal Languages and Their Relation to Automata. What made you do that? Oh, so. And who was, El who was Ullman? Uh, right, uh, <laughs> Ullman was a graduate student there. Um, uh, McCluskey uh, asked me if I would teach a course in computer science. And I had to ask him, well, what does one teach? Because there were no books, there were no such courses. And he gave me four papers, and he said, if you cover these four papers, it'll be a good course. Mm -hmm. So I developed notes for the course, uh, and afterwards I looked around, I wanted a co-author, and Ullman uh, and I then took these notes and developed them into mm -hmm. a book. Did he take your course? Yeah, he took my course, and Alejo also took the course. Uh, in fact, uh, I think there were six students in the course. <laughs> Uh, Brian Kernahan was in it, ah. uh, and don't remember the names of the other three, mm -hmm. but all of them were very successful. Very well-known people. Yes, yeah. um, this book has had a tremendous impact on the field. I must say, it the book has was used in just about every single department uh, in computing science, and it set a, a bar, a standard that was hard for other textbooks in that field to meet. It really was something. Um, I noticed this. Over the two years from March 67 through January 69, you published 11 papers with Jeff Ullman. Right. That's a tremendous amount while you're writing this book. So right. you, were not, you were not just taking what was known in the field, you were producing the stuff that had to right. go into the textbook. Yeah, well, well when you write a, a textbook when a field doesn't exist, you run into all kinds of interesting questions and you sort of have to answer yeah. them. Uh, but a, a lot of this came after we wrote the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, So you come to Cornell in 67 and you kind of begin changing fields. The book came out in 69, you probably right. finished it in 68, right. and you changed fields essentially completely, not just formal languages and automata theory, now it was algorithms. Yeah, I, I realized that uh, the area of computer science was much broader. Uh, see, initially I was thinking of writing a theory book for the theory in computer science, mm -hmm. but I, I realized that the field, a uh, much more important area of it was algorithms, and there ought to be a theoretical book mm -hmm. in algorithms. And uh, so I developed uh, many of the things uh, like uh, uh, I had worked on divide and conquer and depth first mm -hmm. search and uh, many, many of these things. And then, then I went, of course, to Stanford for a sabbatic. Yeah. And I happened to share an office with Bob Targen. And he was working on a, trying to determine if a graph was planar. He was a PhD student, he was a not PhD, a faculty. He member. was a PhD student. And since I knew how to uh, solve this problem in time n log mm -hmm. n. Uh, I worked with him to reduce mm -hmm. the, the log n factor yeah. and come up with a linear algorithm. Mm -hmm. So th this idea of being in an office is with somebody, that really helped in a way. I right. too, when I went to Stanford in 66 as an assistant professor, I shared an, uh, an office with Jerry Feldman. Right. And we ended up writing an important survey paper together. Right. Only because we're sitting there wondering what the other person is doing. Yeah, no, it's very important to talk to other people. Um, 
and just by by yourself, when you're in an office by yourself, um, you're kind of isolated, yeah. you know, in a way. Uh, and just talking to people, you have an idea, and they see it slightly differently, and mm -hmm. they describe it to you differently, and gradually you you have a much clearer yeah. view of it. Yeah. You ended up writing five papers with Bob Tarzan. Right. And he actually came here as a faculty member. Yeah. He was, he was here for, for, I think, uh, about a year. One year. Uh, he couldn't take the Ithaca weather. <laughs> right. And it's interesting that he went to Princeton. So there has been this, this triad, right. three universities, Stanford, Princeton, and Cornell, which have been very important in your life and yeah. his life and right. so on. Interesting. Right. Uh, out of this work on algorithms came a book with a Hohen Ullman. Right. And this, I think, was even more important uh, uh, a, a right. setting the standard than the formal languages and theory. Uh, formal languages and uh, that book was giving, talking about material that people really didn't have to do much research in after that. Right. But the algorithms are still working, still right. going on. Tell us about that book. Well, <coughs> uh, Aho and Ullman were very influential. Uh, and it's it's a little bit un unfortunate that for the Turing Award they didn't get included, uh, it, because they made significant mm -hmm. contributions to the algorithms yes. area. And uh, you know I, I get a lot of credit, uh, but uh, you know I it's a, there are a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. It's just one person tends to get singled out, yes. and maybe yeah. it's not totally fair, but that's that's what happens. Well, you were the senior person of all these three. Well, that, yeah. that's, that's true. I, I was a little older, and, and both uh, uh, Allman and Aho took courses from yes. me and so on. Yeah. But, but their contributions were incredible. S so this, this is algorithms in general, a lot of work on graph theory. Right. Um, all over the place. Um, so these first 10 years of yours as a faculty member, 64 to 74, were right. tremendously influential. I think that it, it turns out that most people do their most significant work in their first 10 years. Right. You, would you agree with that? It, uh, I, I, I tend to think so, too. Uh, yeah, part, partly, you seem to have more time. Uh, also, the relationship with graduate students. You're both building your careers, and so you work together in sort of a fundamental way. Uh, when I'm older and work with a graduate student, it's not the same yeah. thing. And in fact, I tell graduate students now who ask me to be their advisor, mm -hmm. I say, you know, you ought to first consider if there's an assistant professor, <laughs> because the relationship you will have will be different. Uh, you will both, you know, you'll be working together trying to build your careers. Yeah. Whereas if you work with me, I'll give you advice and so forth, but the relationship will yes. be different. Yeah. John, let's change topic a little bit and talk a bit about administration, about service to the field. Yes. You were chair of CS from 87 to 92. You took over from me. I was the chair before that. And you immediately became dean of engineering and then dean of engineering. How did the switch happen? What led you to become an associate dean? Well, w one of the things, before I became chair, I didn't think I would like administration. <laughs> uh, but I think our department ran out of senior faculty who could be chair. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of had to become a, a department chair. But when I became department chair, I really enjoyed it. I, I discovered that I could make things happen. Mm -hmm. And so I thought if I enjoyed doing things for the department, maybe I could have an impact on the college. Uh, and so I talked to Dean Street and became uh, associate dean for a year, and then he retired and I became dean. So what did you do differently? What was your vision? <coughs> well, one of the things is uh, that it's, it's really the departments that make up a university. And so I gave a lot more authority to chairs of departments uh, I mean, one of the things that happened to me is a department chair came in and asked for an additional secretary line. And I didn't know how, as dean, I would ever find out if this was really something he needed or whether this was something he thought he could get his budget increased by. 
So <clears throat> I changed the budgeting. I gave departments a budget and told them it was up to them to decide how many faculty they wanted, how much they wanted to pay them, and how much they mm -hmm. wanted to support them. It's just they had to stay within their budget. Mm -hmm. And so I moved all of those decisions out of the college down to department chairs. And I think it had a major impact on the college because if you notice, a few years later, most of the departments had department chairs who were members of the National Academy. <laughs> So how did you try to, to decide who needed more money, what department was better? Yeah, so <coughs> uh, this, this is where I thought the question should be. It should be not what should they do with their money, but mm -hmm. what slice of the pie should they get. And uh, some of the principles I had is I felt some department chairs were simply better than others. And I sort of felt if someone, department chair, is really good and is going to hire good faculty, I ought to give them a little bit more money so they can increase the size and not give so much to someone who's a little weaker. Um, you have to keep the, the actual funding within close yeah. to some, uh, something depending on their workload. But, uh, so I what about things. metrics? How did you judge? Well, <clears throat> one of the things I did is I made a list of the course every faculty member taught and how many students were in it. And then I ranked this and looked at what was the median uh, number of students that people were teaching. And part of it was because of computer science. Computer science was teaching a, a course with a thousand students or something in it. And, but they only had one faculty member associated to it. So I didn't think I should add several faculty for their average teaching load. Uh, that's not what the faculty were doing. Hmm. Uh, and, and actually what I did is I took the middle third, the teaching load of the middle third and averaged hmm. them and, hmm. and used that as so, a... Uh, so a lot has to do with using the right metrics? In oh, order the, to the right metrics are terribly important in, in everything. Hmm. But uh, they're often hard to measure. Oh, they're hard to measure, <laughs> yes. Hmm. Uh, Duffield Hall was built under your administration. Duffield right. connects, it, it took away a large part of the engineering quad. Right. It connects three other buildings. Well, it connects yeah. with uh, Upson Hall and Phillips Hall. Right. There was a lot of controversy over that. Right. <coughs> um, w but one of the reasons we built that particular building is uh, I realized that in the areas, certain areas, we needed vibration-free clean room mm -hmm. space. And it simply wasn't possible to renovate existing buildings mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, another thing, one of the big costs in engineering is whenever you renovated a lab, if you made significant changes to the building, you had to bring the whole building up to the current mm -hmm. code. So we needed a building where you could make reservation, uh, uh, reser uh, you could uh, work on labs without having to mm -hmm. bring the whole building up to code. So we built a building that had labs parallel, but a uh, six foot wide space in between where there was no floor. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have to renovate the building if you mm -hmm. wanted to bring a pipe up or something like that. <laughs> so there are a number of things like that. Uh, but it was very expensive space, so I didn't put la uh, offices in. Uh, asked to have the renovate existing buildings mm -hmm. for that. But, but I should point out one of the things. I gave the architects uh, 12 locations they might build a building in. And then I gave them a list of things that we wanted to achieve. And they came back a few days later and said, John, none of the 12 sites that you've given us really mm -hmm. are the sites which are going to achieve what you want. Here's where you should build the building. And I didn't even think you could build a building there, to be honest with you. But they convinced me that it was the right place to build it. And it has integrated uh, several of the buildings together. And well, the, the important thing that, that, that eliminated a lot of the controversy was this notion of the atrium. Was that your idea? No, that, that, that was the architects. And having a good architect is really mm -hmm. important. Uh, and I wondered if that atrium was going to work because it's relatively narrow and high, yes. and I thought the acoustics were going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. So I told the architects every time I saw them that we weren't going to pay them unless they got the acoustics <laughs> right, and and they did. It's 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 it's, it's, it's really successful. That that's 
about the most successful place on campus as a meeting place for students. Right. People are there all hours of the night in the little right. nooks oh, Well, and that so was on. the other thing. Um, the architects pointed out that if we didn't put locks on the outside doors, mm -hmm. then the building could be used mm -hmm. uh, uh, the whole a lot more. And they said, look, if, if someone wants to secure it, they'll have to pay to put the locks on, so they probably won't do it. Hmm. So, <laughs> so it's one of the few buildings on campus which is not locked Again, today. it was the architect's idea? It was the architect's. Neat, neat. We, we had a really high quality yeah. architects for that building. Hmm. A beautiful job. Yeah. You, in 1992, you were appointed by Bush, President Bush, to the National Science Board which oversees the National Science Foundation. What was it like being on that board? Well, for, for me, this was a real opportunity because I was quite young. Mm -hmm. yes. And one of the things I point out, that this is an advantage of being first in a community. Uh, because just by luck, not by anything else, I was taught one of the first computer science courses. Mm -hmm. And that made me one of the, the senior computer scientists, even though I was yes. young. And when our government was looking for senior computer scientists, there weren't people ahead of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had been in high energy particle physics, I'd still be yes, waiting yes. today for the senior faculty yes. ahead of me to retire. So I just mentioned, you know, computer science is changing. And rather than stick in the old field, mm -hmm. a, a young person ought to move into the new directions because then they will be the senior people. I'm going to ask you later what those new directions are. <laughs> okay, we can come to it. But it, it was a, a very important experience mm -hmm. for me because uh, after two years, I became chair of the committee that uh, brought any expenditure to the board. Mm -hmm. The board has to have a process by which expenditures can be brought to it and voted on. Or, and so every expenditure came through, I, I brought to the board. Huh. So I sort of was spending seven and a half billion dollars a year for mm. the last four oh. years I was there. Mm. And uh, things that, one of the things I did is uh, Bush wanted to reduce the size of our government. Uh, so he set line counts on each mm. division. And the Navy used to provide all the logistics for U.S. personnel in the Antarctic. Uh, but, and we simply paid them. Uh, they were happy to do it. But with their line count, they didn't want to use up their line count. So mm -hmm. one of the things they did is they said, you'll have to find private contractors to do it. Mm -hmm. So I became responsible for all U.S. personnel in the Antarctic. Uh, and is that uh, why you went down there? That's why I went down there. We were rebuilding the South Pole Station. and How was it down there? Well, uh, it, was, it was minus 30 at the South mm -hmm. Pole, but it was actually felt warm because the sun was shining. Uh. Uh, and there was no wind, mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it was that was a good experience. The other one was was the internet, uh, mm -hmm. because Jack Schwartz was at ARPA, which is now mm -hmm. DARPA, and he didn't. He realized that uh, the internet had been was being used by scientists to collaborate. It was no longer a research project, mm -hmm. and he didn't want to use his research money for that. So he called me and said, could we transfer it to NSF? Mm. Uh, so then I sort of became responsible. It was NSFNet. And then I realized there was a lot of pornography on it. Mm. And I became nervous that someone was going to challenge NSF and say, why are you supporting pornography? Mm. So I talked to staff and said, you've got to privatize NSFNet. Mm. And that's what uh, happened. And uh, one of the interesting things, um, I realized that there would be a lot more domain names sold than what people were planning, and this, some company was going to make a fortune. So what we did is the staff said, well, look, why don't we in the contract say if they sell more than a certain names, they will give the money to NSF, hmm. uh, which we could use to fund science. And I thought it was a good idea. I asked my attorney, who always was with me, and fine. Uh, but what I didn't realize is someone was going to sue us. Hmm. And someone who bought 100,000 domain names filed a suit claiming it was unconstitutional uh, because an agency cannot sell something for more than it costs. That's hmm. not a profit, it's a tax. a tax. And agencies don't have the authority to tax. Hmm. So we got sued and we lost the suit, 
But uh, fortunately, the judge said, however, Congress can pass a tax retroactively, mm. which uh -huh. we asked them to do. And hmm. I, I don't know how it eventually happened because I went off the board about that yeah. time. And hmm. So you, you saw a lot more than most computer scientists. Oh, you get a lot of experience. Yes, neat. Uh, you left the deanship. Right. And became a faculty member. You hadn't done research full time for eight years. Eight years. How right. did you get back in? What did you do? Well, one one thing, uh, the university gave me a year mm -hmm. uh, at at full pay, uh, where I could just focus on research, mm -hmm. and and that got me back. And by this time, uh, computer science had moved into social networks, so I started there for a mm -hmm. while. And then I moved into machine learning because mm -hmm. I realized that was such a big area. And that's where I'm working now. And, and that's basically AI, and, and our department looked down on AI back in the 70s. Right. Well, there was a lot of hype yes. and, and not too much contribution. But uh, actually, one of the things that, that changed it was this ImageNet competition mm -hmm. uh, and AlexNet uh, because it really worked. And a uh, number of companies tried this technology in a wide range of mm -hmm. areas, and it worked. And this has made it a big, big area. So that's machine learning. Machine learning. Machine learning. A lot of it is statistics. A lot? Right. And a lot has to do with information. And uh, one of the things, uh, robotics, I was in robotics mm -hmm. for a little yes. while. But I was looking a little bit at it as mechanical things, having a mechanical robot which would move mm -hmm. things. But that's not really where robotics is. It's uh, because you would think robotics is in uh, mechanical, mechanical engineering. engineering yes. But it's not. Uh, think of driverless cars mm -hmm. as an area of robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. big players are Baidu and Google. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not in manufacturing cars. They're simply going to buy the car and put the information into it. It's the computing. And yeah, and the important things in driverless vehicles are the sensors mm -hmm. and the maps. Mm -hmm. And these have nothing to do, at least I think, yes. with mechanical engineering. Right. It's, mm. it's computer science. Um, so I'm going to get back to where you think the field is going later. But right now, I would like to talk to you about your, or have you tell us about your service to other countries. One thing stands out on your resume that's different from just about every other one I've seen is this continual service, I say starting about 2002 or three, to various companies. Uh, you were on an engineering school advisory board in Hong Kong in 94, but all the rest started about 2003-04. Kuwait, India, Australia, Vietnam, Brazil, Korea, Russia, and of course China. Right. Let's start with Vietnam. How did you get involved? Well, the National Academy asked me if I would go over and help them with a project. Uh, they had started the year before, so mm -hmm. I, I only came in the second year. And unfortunately, they had brought a number of world-class researchers over to set up a program for Vietnam. And what they had told them is, told Vietnam is to send undergraduates to the United States to get PhDs mm -hmm and then go back and improve the educational system in Vietnam. Mm. Well, this would have been excellent advice if it was the United States. But at that time in Vietnam, the top universities were hiring people who just got bachelor's degrees to mm. teach. Uh, and basically, there wasn't the research infrastructure where these PhDs would go back. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I went over there, I realized it was the wrong program. They should have sent people for master's degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, they could have sent five times as many, because they'd only be there one year well, yeah. rather than five. And secondly, they would have to go back to Vietnam because they wouldn't be competitive on sure. the world market, where the PhDs mm -hmm. would. By the way, none of them went back to teach. Sure. <laughs> uh, but th and they could have upgraded teaching much faster. They could have upgraded it after mm -hmm. one year. Mm -hmm. uh, but the prime minister said, look, uh, he immediately recognized yeah. it, that it, it was the wrong program. He said, I can't back off the program now, but I'll add the master's component to it. Uh, but I guess one of the things is when you're young, you, your goals are to build your professional reputation, and that's what you want to do. But when you get older, you, you want to have an impact on the world yes. and make the world a better place for other people. 
And so I worked in a number of countries. Uh, but all of these countries, uh, there's a problem that unless at the very top there's support for education, there's not much you can do. Uh, in one place, I was talking to a university, uh, and I said, why don't you just increase the quality of the computer science department up to the equivalent of Stanford, Berkeley, or Cornell? Mm. And the president said, well, what will it cost? And I said, the only cost would be you would have to reduce the teaching load of three faculty members. Mm. And he said, uh, that's too expensive. <laughs> and and so, you can see, yes. you can't, you can't yeah. have an impact if that's the, yes. the... But when I got to China, China is different. Uh, China knows that they have to improve education. Mm -hmm. And uh, the premier told me, he said, look, one of our top priorities is stability of the country. And to do that, we've got to raise the gross national product so we can raise the standard of living people faster than their expectations go up. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that unless, unless we improve undergraduate education. So in China, there was a real opportunity. So you started there with Shanghai, I think, right? Well, actually, I started in a project. Before that, the Ministry of Education asked me if I would help them upgrade 1,000 second and third tier universities. Mm -hmm. And so I spent time uh, working with 50 faculty at a time to upgrade things, but I realized it wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to the Ministry of Education and said, D -d you're wasting your money. <laughs> let's, let's drop the project. Mm -hmm. And then the president of Shanghai Zhao Tong University said a better strategy would be if I would become a counselor to them, to him, mm -hmm. and help him improve the university, and they could produce high quality PhDs, which would go out to local universities and move up. Uh, <clears throat> sounded like a good idea, but you can see that the time that that was going to take mm -hmm. to do something would be too small. And then I got an opportunity, I sort of became an unofficial advisor to the premier. Uh, I got invited, my wife and I, over four times to advise him and have mm -hmm. dinner with him. And this changed my ability in China. I mean, one of the meetings, the premier just wanted to have it televised, us shaking hands mm -hmm. and broadcast nationally. And uh, that gave me, I now have access to high level officials. If I want a meeting, I get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they will fund literally anything that I ask for. And What are you asking for now? What, how are you think you're going to change? Well, one of the things, I chaired an international committee uh, on how to improve education in China for the premier. Mm -hmm. And we were told that our report could be only one page. <laughs> it may sound kind of silly, but, but it does focus you. When you have to write it in one page, mm -hmm. you ask, really, what are you going to say? And realize if you told the premier to do 10 things, probably nothing would happen. Yeah. But if you tell him just one thing, uh, it's likely to happen. And we told him to change the metrics by which university presidents are evaluated. So this gets back to metrics again. It gets back to metrics. Uh, university presidents have five-year terms. They're government employees, and they'll get another job afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they want a better job. So what they do is they increase the research funding at the institution mm -hmm. and the number of papers published. Mm -hmm. And they can say, look, I increased the research funding at the university by 20%. Mm -hmm. The difficulty with that is they put so much pressure on junior faculty mm -hmm. to raise money that the junior faculty have to work for senior faculty to do it. Mm -hmm. And there's no emphasis on teaching. And in fact, I offered to work with some junior faculty to help them improve their teaching. And they told me they would first have to check with their senior faculty. Mm -hmm. And they came back the next day and said, senior faculty said, don't waste your time on teaching. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, what we're trying to do is change the metrics and make them two, two metrics. One is, what is the quality of undergraduate teaching? And secondly, what is the professional reputation of junior faculty as measured by international experts? Mm -hmm. And to evaluate them, I'm proposing we don't even send their vita. Because mm -hmm. if we send the vita, the international yeah. experts will start to count publications. Yeah. Instead, we'll just ask a few questions. Do you know this person? Just mm -hmm. one sentence, yes or no. Uh, if yes, how do you know them? And then, do you know in one sentence something that they've done that's important? Mm -hmm. And one more sentence, why is it important? Mm -hmm. And if we can write five uh, senior people and two or three of them say, yeah, I know them and he's done this, and it's sort of interesting, mm -hmm. 
that's okay. sufficient. Um, and <clears throat> to, but to do this, uh, to put pressure on university presidents, uh, we have to rank universities on the quality of undergraduate yes. teaching. And that proposed a lot of difficulty uh, because uh, the Ministry of Education is a little, uh, I think, uncomfortable doing it, uh, having a ranking which is a government ranking. Mm -hmm. uh, so we changed it, uh, this January we changed it. Instead what we're going to do is we're going to give teaching awards. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually uh, next week I'm going over to uh, help instruct the people who are going to evaluate the mm -hmm. teaching to give these teaching awards. And they're major awards. We're going to give 50 awards of $10,000 each mm -hmm. uh, to faculty at the top nine institutions. Mm -hmm. And on average, an institution will get six awards. Mm -hmm. But some will only some get four, get and some will get eight. Yes. And there will be a, an official ranking. Yes. Yes. Uh, in, in the fall, uh, we're only going to rank one department mm -hmm. in the spring to test. But in the fall, we'll rank five departments. And then in next spring, we're going to uh, work with 42 universities. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much the working with the, uh, w doing the ranking as sending the message to the university presidents. Yes. So you're going to send people over there to teach people how to evaluate teaching? Did, a lo you, a lot of it will be done by people who are there. Yes, but you have to teach them how to teach. Right. Uh, have you found people to, who understand oh. I've tested the, the methodology uh, last year at Shanghai Zhao Tong University, mm -hmm. uh, and we had Asian faculty come in and evaluate courses, but I also sat in on many of the courses and evaluated them and got the same evaluation. But what's interesting is realize the courses are taught in Mandarin, mm. and even though I know no Mandarin, I came up with the same evaluations. <laughs> Because what we're doing is we're scoring them uh, is how well does the faculty member, how comfortable is the faculty member with the material, how well is they are engaging the students, mm -hmm. what fraction of the students are listening and what fraction are on their iPhone, mm -hmm. things like this. And what was interesting, I could even afterwards uh, tell some of the faculty how to improve their lecture, <laughs> even though yes. I, I didn't know what they were lecturing That's on. Neat. That's good. Um, so you'll be going there in April, that's right. next week? Next that's week, next week. Weeks. Good. Have a good time there. Right. So we're the same age. I retired five years ago, although I'm still teaching because our courses right. are so huge. How long are you going to continue at this whirlwind's pace? I, I think I can only another couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but al also, just as you, as long as the department has such a pressing need, for faculty, mm -hmm. yes, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll help them. Yeah. So, what should be the department be doing with its problems? Well, I, I think people have to realize that we're entering the information age, mm -hmm. and uh, this is going to have a tremendous impact. And, and you'll notice that many of the students already realize this. Yeah. That I believe that one tenth of the majors at Cornell are in computer science, yeah. and we're doing one tenth of the teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, with 2% of the faculty. Yes. Uh, I, I think Cornell's got to make a decision uh, to really create, the, make the department into a college with maybe mm -hmm. four or five departments. And it's going to have 100 to 200 faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll be, you know, the equivalent of engineering or arts and science. We already have the college. Well, CIS. <coughs> uh, Should it become a real college? Well, uh, so, so to make it a real college, it would have to do a, admission of undergraduates. Yes, yes. And I, th I think, but I would just change the definition of a college. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd make it a real college, but not have it yes. admit undergraduates. I, I agree. I don't see why we should, we should do that. So we're, but we're getting high quality students from arts yes. and science and yeah. from engineering, and I don't think we would get as high if we did it ourselves. So <laughs> how do you see this? the CIS changing, how well, should computer science get 100 faculty members? How well, would you do it? Well, one of the things, people who, who look at size of departments and cohesiveness un understand that as soon as you get above 25, you're no longer a cohesive mm -hmm. department. So I would break the department up into units. I mean, right, right now, I think we're about 40 faculty. Yeah. And I would add IS to it, which mm -hmm. maybe would be 60, yep. and break us up into four departments of size 15. Mm -hmm. And then each of these could add three per year. 
so we'd be adding 12 faculty a year and we could reduce the teaching mm. load. Uh, what else for faculty? What, what would you tell the junior faculty? How, how should the department help its junior faculty? They're teaching a lot. Uh, the junior faculty are the future of the department, and we've got to invest in their professional development. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a number of things. One is reduce their teaching load. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, when you become a senior faculty member, you can teach some of the bigger courses. Mm -hmm. uh, but have the junior faculty just teach smaller courses in their area, uh, with one exception. I think one semester you should have them teach a bigger course just to make sure they can yes, be yes. a good teacher. And secondly, we should focus on getting them high quality PhD students. Mm -hmm. I mean, my career was built on my PhD students. Mm -hmm. uh, they were every bit as bright as I was, and working together we did great things. You've had PhD students who were president of a university? Right. Deans uh, at universities? Right. Chairs? Right. All over the place? Right. Yes. And one is yes. heads uh, uh, the CI AI lab at MIT, mm -hmm. places like that. They one won is MacArthur Awards. Yeah, and one is oh. deputy director of NSF China, yes. or not NSF, uh, Microsoft yes. Research Asia. Yeah. Uh, and it was these were just incredibly bright and mm -hmm. uh, dedicated students. And when you work with people like that, it builds your career. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we've got to help. The junior faculty have much better, much the best mm -hmm. PhD students in the world. How you've been here a long time? Tell me what you think about our whole environment, as a, perhaps compared to other places. Well, the environment there's there's a lot of things that are good, but let me, f for one sure. thing, talk about the physical area. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have to live in big cities. Yes. If if so, we're not going to attract right. them to Cornell, but there are others who want to live in a rural environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know what the percentages are, maybe 20% of the people, a uh, lot fewer. But we are the only university, only really major university that's in a rural environment. Yeah. So the competition for us for high quality faculty, uh, we have a better chance yes. than others. That's true. And coming here, there are things you can do. You can go skiing. There's a ski area, there's a number of ski areas 20 minutes yes. from here. Uh, California, you can argue the skiing is better, but you'll never do it because it's four hours yeah. away. Uh, there's a lake for sailing. There's uh, the uh, a lot of Finger Lakes trails, mm -hmm. and uh, there's just uh, people who come here like the outdoors. They like yeah. athletics and sports and things, and so the environment is actually a very good environment, uh, un unless you in some sense yes, have to be yeah. in a big city. Right, there are people who want the city. Yeah. What about the computer science department? Well, it's, yes. it's, it's one of the top computer mm -hmm. science departments in, in the world. Yes. And um, uh, right now there is this, this issue with size. But if, yeah. if we can get the teaching, uh, the number of students just increase so rapidly. But if we can yeah. get the, grow the faculty fast mm -hmm. enough, and re get the teaching load back. But this has happened to every university yes. in the country. So we're, everyone is in yes. this, and we'll, we'll resolve it in a year or two, and it'll be a fantastic place for, for faculty. A sort of a last question. You've been able to anticipate the direction of the field several times. You've given something like 38 talks talking about the future of computer science. What would you tell our young PhD students what they should be learning and studying, what they should be doing, and even our undergraduates. Well, I think our undergraduates know pretty well uh, where the world mm -hmm. is going. Uh, they probably watch television or read Time magazine or, or something. I, I don't know just how they get their yeah. information. Uh, but they seem to get it. That's why the number of students has increased long before yeah. faculty realized that there was a change. Uh, and uh, I would just tell faculty, being the first in a new direction really enhances your career. Mm -hmm. And uh, simply because you've taught a course for 10 years uh, doesn't mean you should continue to teach yeah. it. Uh, you should explore where things are going and start moving forward. And what are those new directions, in oh, your well, opinion? In, in my opinion, uh, we're moving in, there's an information revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be as big as the agricultural revolution mm -hmm. or the industrial revolution. Uh, and uh, people should start thinking about things. Uh, for example, 
uh, what percentage of the population is going to be needed to produce all the goods and services mm -hmm. we need. And so one of the things where I work in other countries, uh, I listen to them as they're planning. And uh, China, for example, believes it's only going to be a small fraction of the population, like 25%. Mm. And some other countries are thinking about guaranteed financial income, whether mm. you work or not. And that doesn't mean that you're going to write someone a check. What you might do in the United States to give someone uh, an income is give free medical. Mm -hmm. Have the federal government pay all the doctor bills. Uh, and one of the things that could do is it could improve medicine here. Uh, in, I believe in Germany, when they contract for someone to build a road, the contract is not only to build the road, but to maintain it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so they figure out how much should they, what materials should they use and so forth to reduce their total costs. Mm -hmm. And with medicine, if a, if, a, uh, if a medical organization had to uh, treat someone for life and they got so mm -hmm. much per year independent of how well that person was, they would invest in wellness yes. to reduce their costs later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, the, the world is changing in lots of ways, and I would start, you know, and that's why when you're getting an education, you shouldn't just focus on computer science. You should take a few courses in mm -hmm. other areas. I mean, if you're interested in building a, a company, maybe you ought to take a course or two in business. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're, yeah, or if you're thinking of going to just work for a company, maybe in human, you take a course in human resources mm -hmm. to see what motivates people. Yeah. Or you want an impact on the world, take courses in sociology and mm -hmm. things like that, a broader education. Yes. In, in this sense, IS is a very good major. Right, um, right. You're branching out more looking at other fields, law. Right. Uh, uh, history, just about everything. Oh, all of these areas yes. are important. Yes. Now, now, you can't take a course in all of them, but no. uh, uh, used to at least explore a little. Mm. Yeah. So, does this say something about our undergraduate requirements? Oh, I would do. I would change the requirements mm -hmm. drastically. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't have so much course requirements. I would say uh, you've got to take a certain number of courses, credit hours in humanities, mm -hmm. a certain number in social sciences, mm -hmm. and so on. But let the faculty advisor and the student figure out mm -hmm. just which courses. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think a lot of we, our- We've tried to do that a little bit with our, our vectors and so on. Yeah. Right? But I don't think the, the, the field is so large, you, there's a limit to how many core courses you can ask. Well, I think take. the number of requirements in computer science mm -hmm. is at a limit, the maximum that yes. the arts college yes. will let us take. Yeah. I think we should reduce mm -hmm. it because Part of your education is not just what you learn in courses, but it's interacting with other students, yeah. being engaged in social activities. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to a college education, which yeah. is more than just focusing. In a sense, we shouldn't be educating for living, making a living, we should be educating for life. That's right, that's, that's uh, right. Um, that, that used to be the way it was. That's and right. I think that has changed too much. Right. Um, John, this has been wonderful. I've, I've learned a lot in talking to you. Is there anything final word you would like to say? Uh, no, uh, um, it's, it's, it's just that the world is changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would hope that Cornell as a university uh, would play a major role. I mean, we have people in all kinds of disciplines who could help make the world a better place mm -hmm. uh, for people. Uh, uh, almost, you know, if you ask why are there so many social problems in the world mm -hmm. today? Well, in sociology and, and many of the other departments, there are experts. And mm -hmm. I think we should think not just as a university, but put together teams from major universities to try mm -hmm. to solve some of the world's yeah. problems. So let me mention one thing that helped computer science mm -hmm. uh, when it, this is back in 67. Mm -hmm. When we were trying to attract high quality PhD students, we had a tremendous reputation in Asia. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that reputation was the agricultural yes. school. Yes. Uh, there was someone, I think in 1920, who went to China and mm -hmm. developed new strains of rice and wheat. Yeah. And this had such an impact in Asia 
that it built Cornell's reputation. Mm -hmm. And that helped not just the agricultural school, it helped, helped the whole university. Yes. And we should be engaged mm -hmm. at things yeah. of that level uh, now as a university to really yeah. be world class. Well, I, th I think that's precisely what you're doing and going over to China so often and, and right. helping them with their education. That's the same thing what those people did in the 1900s for agriculture. Right. Right, but it would be better, I think, if the university would take this yeah, act yeah, on rather yeah. than me. Right. Maybe that's your next job. To get that, oh, that's what, I'm that's what I'm trying to do. I mean, China gave me this, this award, mm -hmm. which is the highest award they'll mm -hmm. give to a foreigner. But instead of giving it to me, it could have gone, gone to Corn the Cornell. Mm -hmm. no. Well, thank you, John. Yeah. This has been wonderful. Oh. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's well, been a nice 50 years, I must say. Right. No, and, and, and thank you for, for that's, volunteering that's, to, be, sure. to, to do this. Uh, sure. You've done an excellent yeah. job. And, mm -hmm. and also the job, you know, we didn't get to talk about the impact that you had mm -hmm. on, on compilers. Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote one of the first books there yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. had a tremendous impact. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very yeah. much.